Appreciate it. Good morning. I want to welcome all of you this morning. We're glad to see you here and want to welcome those of you joining us at home on YouTube. We're glad you're tuning in and worshiping with us. Hit the send and the like button. Let others know about our worship together. Do want to mention real quickly, you may or may not notice it, those of you who have been uh, participating in Sunday School <laughs> know for several weeks we're having air conditioning problems that started uh, back when we had the windstorms and the electrical outages, you know, that were so widespread. It apparently has done a number on several of our units. We've had several units out in the Sunday School classes for several weeks. Well, now this morning we've got a unit failing. We only have half of the system going in the sanctuary so it may you may notice that this morning but bear with us we've got the insurance company and expecting and electricians inspecting and we will eventually get this all straightened out is there no one with announcements steve you have an announcement okay well come on up it's in the bulletin and it's we've put it in the cross beams and that but on august the 13th we are going to have a church-wide conference for voting on disaffiliation and the only reason i'm i'm mentioning this is because this is an important vote for the life of our church and and our direction that we will be going it's important that everybody at least familiarize themselves with the issues that we have and try and attend and make your vote count for this disaffiliation process or whatever you feel like. But I do want to, I, I don't want the church to become apathetic about the process and what's happening because it is important for the life of our church. So it's on August the 13th at 3 o'clock. Sunday afternoon, and I think we did put that in cross beams, and we've been waiting to send out a letter to the, you, you will be receiving a letter, we're waiting for a letter from the district superintendent, which will actually be a letter from the superintendent to the members of the congregation. Once she sends that to us, then we will forward that to all of our, to all of our professing members, but we haven't received that yet, the reason that's been a little bit slow in going out. As soon as we get that, we'll get that out to you. But put that date down and, and try to schedule it. We've already had some have got that date and said, oh my goodness, that's when we've had a vacation planned or, or whatever. And we've already had people scrambling to undo some of their schedules so they can be here because it will be an important day. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. I'm not seeing any other announcements. So, Cabe, if you can come on up. And uh, those of you who are able, if you will stand, we will enter into the spirit of worship. You'll please join me in the call to worship. Live by the power of the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desire of any flesh. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness. The fruit of the Spirit is faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And our first hymn is number 347.
remain standing as Kate comes to share with us our prayer of confession and praise. Please join me in prayer. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you joys beyond understanding. Forgive us of our sin, we pray. Pour into our hearts such love for you, that loving you above all things, we may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God's peace be with you. And also with you. Would you extend a greeting of peace and welcome one to the other?
Amen. Thank you very much. Join me in prayer. Lord God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I'd invite you to stand as Cabe comes uh, for the reading of a passage from Ephesians 6. This is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given, given me that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambas ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. This is the word of God for the people of God.
praise team for the wonderful music this morning. We are continuing uh, during this Pentecost uh, season and summer season to look at the Apostles' Creed, and we've looked at the affirmation in the Creed on God. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, and we noted in the Creeds, uh, both the Nicene and the Apostles, that when it came to the part about Jesus Christ, it expanded quite a bit. And you may want to look at this once again, if you look at page 880 and 881 in your hymnal, where you see both the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed, that then after a rather lengthy sections about Jesus Christ, in the Apostles it comes to just one very short statement, I believe in the Holy Spirit. In the Nicene, it's still much briefer than what was described about Jesus Christ, but it's a little bit more uh, filled out. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, and who was spoken through the prophets. So a little bit more. But the main idea is that the Spirit is the one upon whom we in this life now depend. It is through the Spirit that we read about the various gifts of the Holy Spirit that are given to the, each believer. The fruits of the Spirit, which were alluded to in our call to worship today, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, mercy, and self-control, all of these are byproducts or fruits of the Holy Spirit. It is through the Spirit that we find power to witness, and it's through the Spirit we find in Ephesians 6 that we find victory in this Christian life. In fact, successful living requires that each and every day we depend upon or yield ourselves to the power of the Holy Spirit. And when we look at this passage in Ephesians, which talks about one aspect of the Spirit that engages us in victory or helps us in spiritual battle, there's really two or three things that we need to draw our, our attention to. First of all is just simply the fact that we're in a battle. This is a, The battle is real. Yes, the Christian life is a life of joy and peace and all kinds of blessings from God. But let's, let's be honest, the Christian life is a battle. Paul says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you may be able to take a stand against the devil and his schemes. And he goes on and talks about a struggle against flesh and blood, but it, not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and powers of the darkness of this world and spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. We are engaged in a kind of a spiritual battle. And so Paul says we should be strong. And we need to put on an armor. We need to be prepared for this kind of battle. Because the battle is real. It's interesting throughout the ages, uh, some of the writers, uh, they've talked about the battle of this Christian life. John Bunyan, when he wrote the book Pilgrim's Progress, he talked about this war that is waged against the Christian and, and how we enter into kind of a conflict, spiritual conflict, just trying to live the daily Christian life. The Puritans talked about our battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And all three of those battles can be very, very real. John White, when he wrote his book on Christian living, called it The Fight. That we have entered into a fight. John Wesley, as he prepared believers for a Christian life, he talked about the necessity of the means of grace. And these are the means that enable us to protect ourselves and to engage ourselves and to guard ourselves from the forces of evil that come upon us. C.S. Lewis said there's two big mistakes that Christians sometimes make. One is to have kind of a preoccupation with the forces of evil and, and the powers of evil. He said we can become sort of preoccupied, not realizing our victory is in Christ and get kind of sucked in. But he said the other big mistake is just simply to ignore them as if the devil plays no role in our life and is not trying to stir the pot in our life, our family, our spiritual life, or not trying to tempt us. And, and so he says that the evil one really only has two strategies against the Christian. 
The first is to keep us from making our profession of faith. He wants to keep us from coming to faith in Christ. But once we have done that, the other strategy is to render us ineffective in our Christian walk. So if he can make us weak or get us distracted with temptation or or sideline our attention from following Christ or following into bad decisions and, and the powers of the flesh, then he can render us ineffective in our Christian life. And so Paul in this passage talks about an armor of God that we need. And we think about it in, in all other kind of activities of life. If there's going to be a combat, uh, people get themselves ready. They put on a certain uniform. If you're going to be a football player, uh, very few people would go out and play professional football today or even high school football without the protective equipment. They've got a helmet and they've got shoulder pads and They've got equipment that protect them. It's the same way with hockey. There's, there's equipment that helps protect them when they go into the, the competition. If you ever watch a karate tournament, it wasn't this way 30 years ago, but today they, they ensure they have helmets for the participants and, and pads that protect them when they're punched or hit and gloves uh, to help soften the blow. There's a protective equipment. And even so, Paul says there's an equipment that we as Christians need to be willing to put on. He says, ours is a struggle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces and evil in in heavenly places. So he says, therefore, put on this full armor of God. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, you might take your stand. He says, when the day of evil comes. I think for each and every one of us, there are seasons of temptation. There are seasons of doubt. There are seasons when we second guess God. There are seasons when things just don't seem to be going right and we wonder, am I on the right path or does God really love me? <laughs> I was joking with a friend of mine. We, have as many of you know, are going through a process now of uh, before too long we'll be transitioning into, uh, into retirement and trying to buy our own home. And uh, some friends of ours <laughs> the other day, they had just such a blessing. They, they, it was almost like a God thing. God led them to a home hadn't even got on the market. They bought this home. It was the perfect home. They just loved it. And I jokingly said to my friend, David, God always did love you best. And he just <laughs> laughed. And of course, that's not really true. But, but there are times in our life when we have struggles and, and sometimes uh, the plan of God doesn't become perfectly clear. There are times in our life when we have doubts or we go through a, the loss of a loved one or a deep grief or there's some kind of hurt or some kind of upset. And, and, and just these thoughts kind of sink in. Does God really love me? Does God really care for me? Why do I feel this way? Why well, I'm having all these problems? All of these things. And so Paul makes it very clear. He says, when this day of evil comes upon you. He doesn't say if. Each and every one of us are going to have times of temptation. Each and every one of us are going to have seasons in our life when we struggle and we struggle sometimes just to hold on to our our faith that God is really there that God is really present that God is there even in the midst of things that are very hard for us to understand relationships go awry we wonder if healing can really come is God can God really heal this marriage can God really heal this relationship all of these things can be used as the forces of evil come upon us and and cause us to doubt or turn away from or ignore or just become distracted from our primary love of God. But but then Paul says there's an armor, there's a way we can protect ourselves from this struggle. And the Holy Spirit is working in and through this armor, preparing us for spiritual battle. And so he goes on and he says, Therefore put on the full armor of God, that you may be able to stand when this day of evil comes. He says, Stand then firm with a belt of truth. And there's been so many uh, explanations of the symbolism of these different aspects of the Christian armor. But truth is something that surrounds us. It's something that girds us. A belt surrounds us and just encompasses us. And... And Jesus is one who said, 
Christians shall know the truth and the truth shall set them free. Sometimes we get away from that great proclamation. It was Scott Peck, the famous psychiatrist, who interestingly enough came to faith not through a study of the Bible, but through a study of psychiatry, and he came first to a conclusion that there really is evil in the world. He said in his study of psychiatry and medicine, he could see that so many of the cases he dealt with were truly cases of chemical imbalance or malfunction of the body, and people needed medicine to bring them into balance. But they said there was a certain number of cases that just didn't seem to fit the medical model. And he said he began to realize there was something deeper going on there, and there was a kind of a spiritual battle going on. And it was a force of evil. And he said as he looked into it more and more and more, he realized that people get caught up in a series of lies that they tell themselves, of mistruths that they tell themselves. They tell themselves that enough, they begin to kind of believe these things. And he began to see in the Bible that the evil one is described as the father of lies. That the, the evil one in scripture is portrayed as the one who deceives and lies to kill and to destroy. And it's when we get caught up in these lies that life goes wrong, that, that life gets off track, that, that the decisions we make are not honoring him, and all of a sudden life really uh, takes a negative turn. And so we can see more clearly what Jesus was getting about when he said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And truth is liberating and truth is life giving. And the very first thing he says here is that we need to surround ourselves with truth. Stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. And then he talks about a breastplate of righteousness. Now, a breastplate is something that guards our chest and it guards our heart. And it's interesting that the writer of Proverbs says, Guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flows the springs of life. And it's amazing. In fact, I've done a whole sermon series on the past about the nature of the heart, how much the Bible talks about what flows from the heart, what is welling up from deep within us. That's what really matters. And we need to guard our heart. We need to make sure it doesn't become a polluted spring, but a spring of fresh water and God's Spirit. That's why Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, He's going to be like a, a flowing stream of water just flowing through us and rushing through us. And that's the image of the Holy Spirit flowing through us. Not a polluted spring, but a fresh stream of water that's cleansing and purifying and refreshing and renewing. And so he says we should guard our heart uh, with this breastplate of righteousness and by pursuing. It's one of the reasons Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because when we're seeking God's kingdom and God's righteousness, our heart is, is guarded. Then he goes on and says, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. It's talking about... Putting on the shoes so that we may be ready to go forth and share this good news. That we might be ready to go forth and share this gospel. I have a friend who uh, did her Ph.D. in counselor education and supervision uh, from Regent University. Very highly acclaimed university. Very highly acclaimed degree. She is a professional counselor. She does workshops around the country on the theme of Christian healing, but she spends much of her time in various countries of Africa. Over there speaking the truth and sharing the gospel and bringing healing and love. And when I've asked her about that, I said, all this psychological training, all this training and counseling, and yet she said, yes, but my calling is to be a missionary. It's to spread the good news and the good word of Jesus because... She said, anywhere you're lifting up the name of Jesus, lives are being touched and changed. And she's been used as a psychologist uh, for the missionaries overseas, but also for those people with whom she comes in contact with. And she sometimes says, there are <coughs> forces of evil that they have to deal with. But she said, she is ready to go. So I follow her posts on LinkedIn and sometimes she's in Kenya and sometimes she's in the US and sometimes you just never know where she's going to be posting from because she is on the move. God has 
helped her to shod her feet uh, with the gospel of peace. And she is moving around sharing the good news, uh, this gospel of peace wherever she may go. It goes on in verse 16. It says, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Uh, this is defensive. Faith is a way of blocking out. We, we trust when the thoughts come that are not honoring God. We, we trust when the situations come that are baffling. That by faith we just say we know the truth. That uh, this is not an assault from God. This is an assault from the evil one. And we can stand on the truth. We can take the shield of faith and by faith. We can say, we do not yield ourselves to this temptation. We do not yield ourselves to this assault. We're not going to let this uh, temporary setback in life get us down because we know that God cares for us and He has made His provisions for us. Goes on and says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The, the Word of God is like an offensive weapon and it's so interesting that when Jesus faced his own time of trial and temptation he did so by quoting scripture and and when you look at the temptation of Jesus on three different occasions the evil one it came and basically tempted him with lies invited him to buy into various lies and all three occasions Jesus responded by referring to a passage of scripture and it was like uh, those were the scriptures that fended off the lies of the evil one and helped him uh, to stand victorious. And it says, it's so interesting, if you look at that passage in Luke of the temptation of Jesus, it says he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. He was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. There he had these great confrontations with the force of evil, and, and he withstood... Uh, by his faith and by the word of God. But then it says when he came out of that wilderness, it says he came forth in the power of the Spirit. That is such an amazing observation that I, I heard one share so many years ago that he was led by the Spirit into this wilderness where he had his confrontation and confrontations are inevitable. But he came forth from that battle in the power of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us and sees us through the wilderness. The Holy Spirit gives us the resources we need to deal with the battles in our wilderness moments. The Holy Spirit sustains us with living water uh, when our hearts and our spirits run dry and we feel like all the sources have been exhausted. The Holy Spirit replenishes us and leads us through that we can come from that place in the power of the Spirit. And so having realized that this battle is real and being alert to the fact that there's going to be times of struggle, there are going to be seasons of challenge in the Christian life, having realized our need to put on this full armor of God, and I'm kind of laughing, when, when I left... It wasn't to come to this church. I want to make, make sure you know this. When, when I left one of my churches and was appointed to another assignment, there was a kind of a reputation in the conference that the church I was going to was having lots of conflicts and lots of problems. There was lots of divisions in that church. And, and so I was going with a little bit of anxiety and a little bit of angst about all this. And... Uh, there was a group of women that had a prayer group. <laughs> and one Sunday after church, as we were praying, I came into my office and there was a group of about seven women. And they had, they must have got them from vacation Bible school or something. It's something like Sherry would come up with. They, they had a helmet and they had a sword and they had a shield. And they, had a, they said, Pastor, we're coming to pray you in to your next appointment, before you even go to that church, we're going to pray that you put on this helmet and uh, we're going to give you a sword. They had a Bible for me and they, they got me all dressed up in the armor of, of God. And they, it was uh, symbolic, you understand, but it was also very, very real. They're preparing for me for battle. And Christy, Christy took stock in that. And so uh, almost every morning when I got up to go over to that church, 
And I'd get up in the morning, Christy would say to me, did you put your armor on? Have you got your armor on? She, she was just reminding me that people were praying that I would be equipped. And, and, and it was. Uh, we had a wonderful ministry there and, and things settled down and, and it, was, it was a wonderful time of God blessed. But then there's another element that comes out here in verse 18. And I have talked about this before of how these themes in the Christian life, how prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit and faith, all these things mingle together. So having said to put on the armor of God, this is what he says, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all of the saints. As, uh, as one person says, we put on each piece of the armor with prayer. Prayer is the tool with which we dress ourselves and prepare ourselves for the battle. And so, basically, Paul's saying here is pray on all occasions, pray at all times, pray all kinds of prayers. He says prayers and requests, and in one translation, you talk about making petitions and and uh, um, all different types of prayer, intercessions and, and different types of prayers for all kinds of people. And to pray for all people at all times, for all of these requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints that we need to continually be in prayer. Not only for ourselves, but uh, we need to be praying for one another. We need to be praying for one another. Because, just think about it. If, if, we, if we from time to time kind of go through seasons that are difficult and challenging and hard to understand, we can be well assured that there are other people, people sitting right here today, our friends, our brothers, our sisters in Christ, they've got their struggles as well. There's some kind of struggle in their family. There's struggles with their children. There's struggles of health. There's struggles of occupation. There's struggles in their relationship. There's struggles in their own walk and journey. We, we need to be aware that we need to be a community of prayer. I, I, I loved the interview they did with Captain, was it Sully, who was the, the airplane pilot that brought the plane, you know, the plane that took off in New York and it hit some birds and it came around and he landed that plane in the Hudson River. You remember that story, that incident? Got that plane down safely. Not a loss of life, not a loss of passenger. I think his name was Captain Sully. They interviewed him uh, on a national television show sometime after that event. And one of the interviewers said, when you realized you'd hit those birds and the engines weren't going to start, you were going to have to bring that plane down. Uh, before you brought it down, did you pray? And he said, no. He said, I didn't have time. But he said, I was fully convinced that there were 138 people on this airplane that were praying very fervently for me. <laughs> he said, this airplane instantly became a community of prayer. <laughs> and 138 people, and probably some people at the control tower that realized what was going on, played that, prayed that plane down safely into the Hudson River and uh, that's what we need to be for one another. We need to be a community of prayer for one another that when when our lives are up there and we think we're flying high and all of a sudden we hit a flock of birds and things are crashing down, we've got a community of people who are there to pray for us and all of this is the way the Holy Spirit works within us. Through these prayers, through this armor of God, in all of these ways, God he equips us. I believe in the Holy Spirit, it says in the creeds. The Holy Spirit, Jesus says, came to be alongside us, to be our comforter, to be our guide. To be our source of power, to enable us for our witness, to give us the fruit of the Spirit we talked about in the call to worship. To give us the gifts that we might be used in the body of Christ. And to enable us when the battle rages on, to bring us to a point of victory 
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thanks be to God. with the joy they'd like to share this morning. Everybody have a safe and enjoyable 4th of July? Yes, okay, Christy. Yeah, and I want to, I don't know if you heard all of that. I should have had a microphone for you, but uh, basically talking about a young lady that lived in the community just down the street from the church, which our church kind of adopted in, 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 in kind of a missional way, very, very struggling family. She's living up in Montana now. But one of the things she said, and, and this just goes back to sometimes you don't realize uh, how important little things are, but uh, before we took her back to the airport, she wanted to come by. She wanted to see where she had lived. That house is torn down now, but she wanted to see that place again. And she came by, as Christy said, to the church. And then she saw the blessing box, okay? And, and she, Christy said she kind of paused and looked at that, and she said that blessing box was a blessing to me because she said every day I walked home from school, and came by that blessing box and, and went and she said, I knew that in, on some days that was really the only food she was going to have. She said that blessing box blessed me in so, so many ways. So the foods you bring, the monies you donate, lives are touched through uh, some of these ministries in, in a far greater way than we probably are going to know. Anybody else with a joy or a yes? Hey, I bet we could get her to come up and tell some stories about you when you were a little girl. <laughs> Maybe some little, some little funny tales. <laughs> yeah, we're glad to have you. Good to see you. Anybody else? Anne, did you have a great trip? Did.
We're glad you had a safe trip and an enjoyable time, and we're glad you're back. Thank you. Anybody else? Fourth of July or activities or anything to share? Yes. Congratulations. How about that? Wonderful. Very good. Very good. Concerns. Um, seems like there are... Now, you know, you know that we had a service last week for Troy Lefebvre, so keep their family in your prayers. Um, Sherry, you've got a kind of a prayer concern going on. They're checking in the hospital tonight at St. John's, and uh, so hopefully Sherry's going to be another grand. Which 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 grandchild is this going to be? Number three. Number three. Okay, and if she goes in tonight and has the baby, uh, my understanding is Claire may be the nurse. Uh, she's a pediatrics nurse, or is that what you call it? Or yeah, so uh, Claire may be one of the nurses involved in this occasion. So that's, that's kind of neat to have a family connection like that. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we just thank you uh, for this season. We know that many are traveling today and we're in that vacation season. So we do pray for those who are on the road or traveling, for those who have had trips and have come back safely. We give you thanks for that. We thank you for new life, and we thank you just for the joy of our family. We thank you for connection with friends uh, who have been here and have come back and can share how their life has been touched and, and blessed by this church. And we just pray that we will continue to do that, just to sow seeds of your blessings, sow seeds of your kindness. Shod our feet with the gospel of peace and just uh, lift up Jesus everywhere we go. For we truly want to do this to his glory. And even so, we come now to pray as he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll invite our ushers to come, and as they come, let us just continue in prayer. Lord, bless. Bless us, and we thank you for the blessings you have provided for us. Help us to be joyful givers and good stewards of all you entrust to us in Christ's name. Amen.
our hymn is number 539. We'll sing verses 1 through 4. O Spirit of the Living God. Blessing to have our bell choir with us today. That was such beautiful, beautiful music. We appreciate it so much. Go forth now in peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.